Welcome to another edition of On the Bookshelf. I'm Pete Solomon. The world is growing ever smaller, yet our planet remains a wide variety of cultures. In her 2020 book, Speechless, Esma Litim describes her family's move from Algeria to the United States, their assimilation to American culture, while still embracing the elements that made their previous life so enriching. Through the eyes of a remarkable mother, now writer Esma Litim shares an excerpt from Speechless, Mama's Story. My mother is the strongest woman I know. I'm writing this book about her, for her, through her eyes. I'm dedicating this book to the entire Litim family, my father, my mother, my two sisters, and my two brothers. As you read through, I want you to feel emotion. I want you to see perspective and understand growth and hope because that is how the story was born. Hope, growth. As you read through, I want you to grow with my mother. I want this to be a different life you are watching through your eyes. My mother exemplifies power and perseverance and I want you to feel that too. My mother's story is a unique one, decades of a life-changing atmosphere constantly manifesting what my mother is and where she is today. I write this for her to allow her to tell her story to the world to let the world know who she is and the fight she fought and continues to fight for her youngest son, the baby brother of the family, Muha. I want you to feel, I want you to imagine, I want you to be. Hear her words so deep you imagine her world in front of yours and allow her narrative to be told. Allow her story to be echoed by families going through the same. Allow her story to give others a light to look to. Allow her story to allow others to remind themselves, there is hope, it is not just me. We are in this together. We fight for our bloodstreams. This story will bring you right to the present, to the exact moment we can both look at the clock, and it will read the same, if not hours behind or ahead. Your clock will strike, and mine will too, and you will understand the exact emotions my family is feeling by the end of this story. I invite you to open your mind as my mother introduces her life to you, as she opens the door to tell you the story, the story of Safiya Litim. Thank you. Esme Litim, thank you very much for joining us. Thank, thank you, you for, for sharing your story. It's obvious that you inherited your mother's lust for learning. Mm -hmm. it's, it's obvious that you have similar competitiveness and leadership skills. Uh, it's interesting, uh, early on in the book, you tell the story about when she was a middle schooler mm -hmm. and she led a coup against <laughs> a teacher who was less than committed in middle school. Uh, you have wonderful background, a great education. You're a graduate of Boston Latin. You're a graduate of Bentley University. Several of your siblings went to business school, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And you picked a very good one. One of the most interesting things about the book is that it's written in the first person, mm -hmm. but it's not written in your person. It's written as if it's coming from your, your mother's mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, when you were writing it, and I know that you spent a lot of time interviewing her, collecting stories, not only from before you were born in Boston, uh, before your parents moved from Algeria to this country. Uh, when you were writing the dialogue, uh, could you hear your mother's voice in your head? Absolutely. Um, I spent months interviewing her and so I felt like a lot of times when I put stories together it was hearing her voice as I was, I was, I was writing it. So, um, yeah. So much of the book, especially the first half of the book, are recollections that your mother shared with you. And uh, much about her childhood in Algeria. Uh, it's funny how cultures change. Mm -hmm. uh, here in the U.S., uh, couples get together and uh, they, they go out and they learn about each other and if everything seems right, they marry. Uh, but your mother uh, had an interesting uh, background toward her marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, she met the man who became her husband, Brahim, mm -hmm. at a party. Mm -hmm. And as you write, she knew almost immediately there was something special about him. They knew it. And, <laughs> and he, he is, is a man who was polite and respectful, mm -hmm. a man of many talents. He could do a lot of things. And uh, 
your mother and your father had quite a ride from one side of the world to another. Oh, yeah. But uh, I'm guessing the greatest challenge was uh, raising you and your four siblings so well. Yeah, I would say that that is probably the most difficult aspect of moving from one country to the other. I myself, am, I'm first gen, but I understand the difficulties and the adversities that they had to go through when it comes to learning a new language, when it comes to learning a new culture, when it comes to having five kids and raising them and um, understanding different systems. So it, it's not easy, but I am very proud of my parents. For, As you should be. For, for doing things the way that they did. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things uh, that your mother talks about uh, is uh, one of the big adjustments had to be coming from the other side of the world in Algeria to a place, Boston, mm -hmm. that's very cold. Uh, and and <laughs> you, this of course is before you were around, but uh, they came uh, toward the winter. And uh, it's, it's difficult enough to get used to the place you live, the neighbors, uh, the day-to-day -day life, when you're a little uncomfortable because there, there's an ocean uh, it would walking distance away, but it's pretty cold. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they came, I think, in December around that time, and it was like a blizzard. And my mom was like, what is, what's going on? <laughs> what is this? We're not used to this. She's like, we need jackets. <laughs> um, I think that's also part of adapting to a new environment, mm -hmm. weather. <laughs> One of the things that I thought really gave some texture to the book was the fact that you uh, use some phrases in French mm -hmm. and Arabic with immediate translations. Yeah. But uh, I, I thought that was uh, a great way to show uh, how you had, how your family and your mother and father uh, had to learn a new language mm -hmm. and assimilate uh, in, and do it at top speed. Right. Um, I was trying to think about, when I was writing the book, I was trying to think about, um, do I write, because it's transliteration. Mm -hmm. So I was like, do I write it in a completely different language, but you can't read it because you can't read Arabic unless you know how to read Arabic. Um, but I thought that the most genuine um, response to just my culture and where I come from is to use transliteration and then have an immediate translation after that. Um, but that's me staying close to my roots. One phrase um, that part of sort of popped up, and, and I will ask you now because if, if there was a definition, I couldn't find it. Mm -hmm. The family is scrambling, it's morning, they're getting off to of school, and your mother says, we're on CPT. What is CPT time? Color people time. Uh, <laughs> so that, that certainly uh, makes it uh, 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 understandable. And the book was written in such great detail, uh, and I thought that was a... Uh, an important facet as we get to know your mother and your family and the people around you in your orbit. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, it may not be the most important thing in the book, but it caught my eye. Your mother's favorite color is purple, mm -hmm. which is why I wear purple. Wow! Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, if we can, let's talk a little bit about your, your family and maybe you could tell us a few words about each. Mm -hmm. um, your mother is an amazing woman, mm -hmm. and to use an American phrase, she rolls with the punches. She's, she's prepared to go over every hurdle. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a remarkable woman, um, and as I said a moment ago, it's obvious that you inherited a lot from her in mm -hmm. that regard. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, your father, Brahim, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, such a versatile individual. He, uh, he can do so many things as you were getting established in America. He was able to uh, do repairs, yeah. other work around the house. And uh, did, uh, did any of the, your uh, brothers and sisters in, inherit that from him? Not really. Um, I think we're all very creative in our own ways, mm -hmm. um, but we don't build houses. Ah. <laughs> there are a lot of ways to be creative. Yes, uh, yes. So, um, Raim and Safia come over as a couple, and at mm -hmm. that point they have two children. They, they have Fatima, the firstborn, mm -hmm. and uh, Salah, uh, the firstborn son, mm -hmm. secondborn son. And, and they came over together, and you write that, or your, your mother uh, makes it clear 
as siblings, they're very close, aren't they? Very close, yes. I think them moving together and experiencing the same adaptability, I think mm -hmm. for them, um, that's how they bonded. Um, learning new language and going to school together, they were very, very close. And then I came into the picture. <laughs> you did indeed. You are, you are the third born. Mm -hmm. uh, and you just, um, just came into the family and, and now it, instead of a happy two, it's a happy three, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yes. And then, uh, then there's Sumia. Mm -hmm. She's here. Yes. Right there. <laughs> and uh, now, uh, now we're up to four. Yes. Uh, but you guys weren't always in the same school because of the disparity in your ages, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what was, uh, to you, what was American school like? I mean, you know, of course, I, I want to make it clear, you were born in the U.S., yeah. so there, there was no conversion from one culture to another. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah. what was it like uh, as you started your school days? I mean, school was regular to me. I think it was just a place to be with friends and learn. And I don't think I necessarily experienced anything different than my older, well, than my younger siblings. But my older siblings definitely experienced it a little bit different because mm -hmm. they had to learn again a different culture. Sure. But they were super young when it happened, so mm -hmm. it's not like they were a little bit older. And, um, but for me, school was fine. I mean. I think living in Boston, school is what school is. You go through, you roll with the punches. Yes, <laughs> yes. And as the older sister, did Fatima guide you along the way? 100%. I feel like she raised all of us. Uh -huh. So we definitely look to her to help us with our homework and you know college essays and all of that stuff. So she definitely, she helped us out. Did you always know you were going to go to college? Of course. Uh -huh. Yeah. I think, I think being first generation, you want to do everything that your parents couldn't do. Sure. So I feel like a lot of us um, made sure that like we did really well in school and we went to college and we got those degrees because that's something that wasn't given to them mm -hmm. or even the opportunity wasn't there for them. Yeah. So, yeah, But I, I know that your mother was an excellent student mm -hmm. and though she didn't pass her baccalaureate when she left middle school, she just continued to learn mm -hmm. and I assume all of that knowledge was passed on to you? Oh, absolutely. She still, she went to like English classes here in America when mm -hmm. she came. Um, and she loves learning, and I feel like we all sort of get that love from her. And she even picked up a little Spanish because a lot of the neighbors yeah, were Latinos. Yeah, exactly. We're from East Boston, so. <laughs> Did you regard East Boston as a happy place when you I loved it. Old? I love it. I still love it. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful neighborhood. It is. A little crowded. Very crowded now. And then your, your <clears throat> youngest sibling was born. Um, your uh, Sala really wanted a brother. Mm -hmm. uh, your mother makes that very clear. Mm -hmm. And one by one, girls show up in the family. And I guess we were disappoint <laughs> well, disappointing I, him. <laughs> I know that's not true. Uh, but Mohammed, yes. as you guys call him, yes. Muha, yes. Uh, he came and uh, he created a challenge, didn't he? Mm -hmm. So he is autistic, he's on the spectrum, um, and he's also non-speaking. So that's where I think it became very difficult for us to um, understand him and learn him as he, as he got older. So that was definitely something that my parents weren't, they weren't educated on because not a lot of people knew what autism was early like 2000s. But I think having four siblings really helped my parents mm -hmm. um, raise him too. We'll come back to that in a little while, but I want to make it very clear that one of the things that's obvious about the book is your mother is completely dedicated to her husband and children and also involved in the community. Mm -hmm. And that gives you somebody really special to look up to. Mm -hmm, for sure. Yeah. Um, now, Moha does provide a great challenge, but as we see the various anecdotes that uh, you share through your mother's eyes, mm -hmm. Uh, it appeared that uh, the other siblings were right there in his corner, and uh, he had a lot of energy, didn't he? He still does. Uh, he still be running around. <laughs> but there are some terrific moments as as he advances. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the ones that, that struck me was when he's taught to ride a bike. Mm -hmm. He likes going fast. Absolutely. He's not super successful when it comes to fully riding a bike. Mm -hmm. But um, we, tr we can't really get him on one now. He'll be like, no, I'm good. Um, but definitely early on, I think he was, he, was, he, was, he was having a good time. He was having a good time. One of the things that your mother mentions mm -hmm. is you come to Boston, which is a city 
known for its great hospitals mm -hmm. and also wonderful schools. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's fortunate, and this is not to disparage any city in Algeria, but it's fortunate that Muha is here mm -hmm. where he's going to get the best care. And, uh, and he has uh, uh, schooling that is, is very positive and he makes progress. Mm -hmm. And his, uh, your mom works with him, and I presume you, you guys pitched in and helped out as well. Uh, I know that he had one particularly fine teacher, uh, Jamie Sasaki Febvre. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us a little bit about her and her she's impact amazing. on your brother? Yeah, no, she's absolutely amazing. Um, she's been his teacher for several years, and she works at Charleston High School, so I don't know if you guys are super familiar, but um, she just really cares about her students. And my brother and her have a very, very strong bond. And he's just so excited. Anytime you say Miss Jamie, he still gets super excited because he knows who we're talking about. Um, but she was definitely there, like watching him grow too and helping him out and like really giving the care that he needs. There had to be some frustrating moments. Mm -hmm. And so I guess you have to be directly involved with autism to understand mm -hmm. the disease and, and uh, how people worked very, very hard to progress. Mm -hmm. um, but you're always, uh, people in the family, particularly your mother, you're always positive and mm -hmm. you always reward your brother for the steps he's taken. Mm -hmm. and, and that has to be very heartening, uh, not only to her as, as he works his way through the school system, but also to you and your brothers and mm -hmm. sisters. Uh, it, it had to be something you were really rooting for and uh, he worked hard. Yeah. I would say that positivity is like a big thing in my family. Mm -hmm. Just making sure that no matter what, like er, life is always going to look up sure. no matter what. And I feel like especially in, ch in a child's development, it's really, really important to be positive to them mm -hmm. and like have that positive reinforcement. So they know, I know like even though he doesn't speak, he understands if he does something right or if he's having a good time and if we're happy for him or if we're celebrating him. Um, so I think it's important to give that positive reinforcement. Another element of the positivity that you espouse is um, you as a family are a team. Mm -hmm. And so many people, and I don't know what it's like for you when you were, say, a teenager, but, but so many young men or young women uh, in their homes, they want a little privacy. Mm -hmm. they, they just want to be themselves and stretch their wings. And right. so as, as a young girl, uh, was that a little hard for you? Like you just wanted a little time for yourself? There was no privacy in my house. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely none. Um, I guess that's the beauty of living with a big family and a tiny apartment. It has its downsides. I'm not saying it's always, you know, sunshine and flowers, but um, I'm glad to say I have that privacy now. So. Well, so, <laughs> so you, you survived a very busy so childhood. And, and now and enjoy the circumstances you have now. Yes, yes. Um, when you were growing up, I know one element of your girlhood that was very important beginning back when you were seven was your love of words, mm -hmm. your ability to write. Mm -hmm. And I, I know you had a special uh, feeling for poetry. Mm -hmm. Where did that come from? Um, I think that was innate for me. I think I was always meant to love poetry. It's funny because my mom says it's because of her. And she's like, I used to write poetry too. And I'm like, mm-hmm. Uh. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I started writing it in the fourth grade. I think I was about like, what, seven or eight years mm -hmm. old. And that's where I really discovered my love for it. Um, shout out Miss Iacono. I don't know if she's still around, but she's the one that pushed me to keep writing because she said, you have a talent. Um, and I love reading books and I love literature and all of that. And so for me, symbolism and wordplay and music and lyricism, all of that is something that I really, really love and gravitate towards. So I still write it to this day. We should note that uh, following graduation, you've had a wide and varied work background. Does this writing skill uh, serve your, your, the various jobs you've had? Um, not necessarily. I think I've lived more of like a, I've had more of a corporate life, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> not really um, writing focused, but I love being able to do it on the side mm -hmm. um, and just sort of like, I still do gigs and events and stuff. So that's really, that's really fun for me. 
Um, I think if I wrote as a career every single day, I'd be tired of it. Uh, <laughs> uh -huh. So it's a special treat when you get it's, to do it. It's a special treatment, yes. That's, that's great. Um, I, I was going to ask this question a little later, but, but I think this is a good time for it. Mm -hmm. You interviewed your mom for four months to prepare for this, mm -hmm. and then ultimately you worked very hard. It's obvious you worked very hard to make this idea a reality. Mm -hmm. What did your mother think the first time she read the book through? Honestly, she didn't fully read, read the book through. <laughs> <laughs> she just knows it's there, but uh -huh. she was with me through it. Yes. So she didn't have to fully read the whole thing, but um, I think she was really excited. I think for her it was more so you're writing about me, of course, you know. Uh -huh. um, but she was excited when I first brought the idea up to her. She was, she was like, yeah, why not? She's like, let's get. But it's actually interesting because the book was actually supposed to predominantly be about my little brother. Interesting. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when I started writing it, the first when I put pen to paper, I realized that I couldn't write this story because I needed people to understand who my mom is and where she came from. So then I took that as the opportunity to showcase our culture and immigration and where we came from, well, where they came from. Our guest is writer Esma Latim, mm -hmm. and uh, her, the book we're discussing is Speechless, which came out in 2021. It is Speechless, Mama's Story. The show is on the bookshelf. Thank you for joining us. I'm Pete Solomon. Let's get back to uh, Muha, if we may. Mm -hmm. um, was there a point as, as he was growing up where he made a big leap and was there a point when there was an element of frustration that he was uh, at, at a certain level and not ready to make the next step? Mm -hmm. I think there were several leaps. Um, I would say maybe elementary school years is when he started to exhibit behaviors of like he's like understanding what's going on around him but at the same time it was really difficult because he, this is i don't want to give too much of the book away neither do i but <laughs> without saying too much um but we just started noticing certain things and it took for us to discover through his actions and through our observations why he would be frustrated at times mm -hmm. or why he would be more aggressive at times and um i guess i'm just going to tell you guys but basically um something that's prevalent in the autistic community is a lot of individuals have either sensitivity to gluten or they're more allergic to gluten and so something that we realized through my mom's little observations were that anytime he had something that had more gluten in it, he would start crying. And we didn't understand. And when he, when he started crying, he would start scratching because he didn't know how else to express himself because mm -hmm. he couldn't speak. He couldn't tell us, like, I'm in pain or I, my, my tummy hurts. Um, so it took for us to really, you know, focus on the small details um, for my mom to realize, oh, I think... I think there's something going on with his diet. So when she brought it up to the doctors, they were like, he could have sensitivity to gluten. Mm -hmm. So once we removed gluten from his diet, we realized that he wasn't as aggressive, as frustrated, as um, upset at times. So I would say that he's had several leaps, but it really took for us understanding him and learning him mm -hmm. um, for us to really watch him grow, if that makes sense. We should make it very clear that Esma is talking about one little part of the book. You really should get the whole picture. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's just a, a small detail. Yes. I didn't give the whole yes. thing away. Just enough to make you interested. It's a, <laughs> it's a fascinating book. Uh, and uh, as, as a family, uh, you're all watching your brother and rooting for him and you're there for him. Did it make you better people? Um. <laughs> My hesitation is not a good look. <laughs> uh, well, let, let me uh, re rephrase it a little bit. Um, you, obviously from the book, you were a great family mm -hmm. and, and very much, as I said a moment ago, mm -hmm. a team. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes adversity brings people together and, and yeah. even stronger. Was that the case with you? I would say yes, for sure. I would say it definitely allows for more patience 
and it helps to learn how to empathize with others who you may not understand operate the way you do. Um, and I think that with my brother specifically, we had to learn him. Mm -hmm. And you have, in order to learn someone, you need patience. Sure. Um, you can't just get upset, like, why are you upset? It's like, no, I have to understand why you're upset. I have to have that level of comprehension. Um, and so, I guess to answer your question, it did make us better people. <laughs> um, would you agree that uh, in the time from when I was a baby to now, uh, we as a people have become much more aware of autism mm -hmm. and alongside that uh, research is being done every day and things are better for babies mm -hmm. going forward yeah. than they were when Mohammed came into the world. Absolutely. I would say early 2000s people weren't really aware as much. Mm -hmm. um, there, were, there weren't as many studies shown. Um, I think doctors were also learning as well as they as they went. Um, the purpose for me writing this book, part of the purpose is so that it gives some type of example to doctors if they want to learn a little bit more about how those maybe on the spectrum may experience autism in their life. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that doctors are learning as we're learning and experiencing too. And that's how the medical profession moves forward. Exactly. The book concludes with a poem that you wrote, mm -hmm. King, uh, King Muha. Yes. Uh, and as you were putting things together, did you decide this was the, obviously you decided this was the ideal way to end the book. Did you ever think maybe I should start it or insert it or did this just flow naturally as, mm -hmm. as the book came to, came to be? I knew I wanted to include poetry in my book. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know. I had lots of ideas with how to incorporate an aspect of something I love into this book, almost like an ode to my brother. Well, two things you love, poetry and your brother. Yes. So, yes, there you go. <laughs> um, but I just thought that that was the the best way to really close the mm -hmm. close the story for the for the for the reader. Um, I was trying to think of maybe I want to insert it throughout the book, but I felt like that was the best conclusion. As my a, words. Not as my a reader, mind. yeah, that's, no. and that's the only part of the book that is your words. Exactly, oh. exactly. Uh, do you still write poetry? I do. Yes, uh -huh. yes. Do you, do you publish it or do you write it just because you like the exercise? Or? I I perform it. Oh, interesting. Yes, so I do perform poetry um, all over the city. So uh -huh. if you guys need somebody to do poetry. Oh, that's great. Yes. Good. How has your uh, poetry changed over the years as you become a, a woman and a businesswoman and, mm -hmm. uh, and all of the other things that you incorporate in your life? I think my poetry grows as I grow. Mm -hmm. um, and I write through my own experiences or those that I observe. Um, and I do a lot of reading. I write a lot about social justice. And so for me, the more I grow and learn, the more I feel inclined to speak on certain issues. And that's, yeah. Uh, I know there are some concerns for all of us for the future, but do you think things in Boston and in the world are getting better? Um, is that a real question, or? <laughs> uh, it's, 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 uh, I think, I think, as a, I think as, a, as a people, I think we're moving in an interesting direction. I think technology is improving, which is helping us advance. Um, and I think that we need to really work as a collective to, to help each other grow. Um, I think one of my quotes in the book is, and I quote myself, yes, but in order to grow, you must water yourself, mm -hmm. and in order for change, we must water each other. A good thought to end on. Mm -hmm. Esmeralda Lee team, thank you so much for thank being you. here, sharing your thoughts, thank you. uh, sharing or your family, mm -hmm. especially your mother, mm -hmm. and thank you for writing a really, really good book. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you next time Thank on the next edition of On the Bookshelf. I'm Pete Solomon. Good night, everybody.